China for the first time in 1984. So I was going to a conference in Hangzhou, China. We flew into Shanghai and took the train to Hangzhou. We got to Hangzhou and we were riding the bus to the hotel and they, they were putting drainage ditches in all the streets in the whole city all at once, okay? It's kind of the way the Chinese do things, okay? They don't do it halfway. They kind of, if we're going to do it, we're going to do the whole city all at once, <laughs> okay? You don't do it in pieces. And, but they were all doing it with shovels. I mean, these were like five foot deep ditches and great big, you know, concrete, you know, bricks to put in drainage dishes for the rains and stuff. And I thought, when I got to the hotel, I thought, boy, why don't they buy these people a backhoe? And then the second day I realized, as we went through the town and I started to see how many people they had, I realized, first of all, in 1984, the Chinese couldn't afford the diesel fuel to run the backhoe if you gave it to them. And second, they have all these people. They have nothing else to do with it, okay? I mean, the people wouldn't be employed. They'd be starving, okay? And so you dig it by hand because you got a lot of people, okay? So when we think about how we would do something, engineer something in the United States, you're thinking about your experience. You have to think about what it's like in the other part of the world, okay? They have different constraints. Labor is cheap in China. Well, it was, okay? Labor is still cheap in places like the former Soviet Union. And India has a lot of cheap labor, but it also has a lot of uh, very highly qualified labor, which is why they're writing software and answering telephones and you know, things like that. Um, so anyway, there's different, different constraints in different places. Uh, I don't, maybe I ought to have a lecture on constraints. Um, hadn't planned on it, but maybe we will. So anybody have a question? See, it's good, good half the class digression. Um, so I wanted to also tell you the story about um, the revelation I had in my junior year uh, here. I took a course, Introduction to Quantum Mechanics. I, it was an elective for me. I didn't have to take this course in the physics department. But, you know, I was told that electronic materials, you needed to know quantum mechanics to understand electronic materials. I was a material scientist, so I took this Introduction to Quantum Mechanics. The, the lecturer was Vera Kistiakowsky. She was the first uh, full professor of physics, uh, woman uh, pr professor of physics at MIT. Her father won the Nobel Prize at Harvard in chemistry. Okay, uh, Vera was very, huh? huh? Smart family. Smart family. Very, very accomplished. Uh, she always brought her great big dog to class. Anyway, um, but she was a very nice woman, and I was flunking the class. I mean, I, I was getting 15s out of 100 when average on the home, homework sets was 85. I mean, I just didn't have a clue what was going on in this class. And so the night before the final, I figured, just like my freshman year, 801, I figured I was going to flunk. I didn't flunk, I got a pass in 801. Um, probably wasn't a very good pass. But I took the textbook the night before the final and I decided I'm just gonna go through and try to figure out the high points, okay? I walked into the three hour final, I finished in an hour and 20 minutes, I looked it over, we couldn't leave before two hours. So after two hours, I actually sat there twiddling my thumbs or playing tic-tac-toe or something with myself, which you can usually win if you play tic-tac-toe. <laughs> but anyway, um, until for two hours, I walked out and I got an A in the course. I mean, I think I came close to getting 100, if not 100, on the final. And Professor Kistiakowski figured if you could do the final, you, that would you be your grade, mostly. A lot of physicists think that way. It's the end point, not how you get there. Um, and so it was a great revelation to me that, oh, it's only the high points. I started thinking about this, and I realized all this other stuff we teach in class is just fluff, okay? There's only one or two themes that a professor can get across in an hour, okay? And I call it guess my outline. And so for the rest of my career at MIT, which I actually did very, I mean, I, I had a hard time the first couple of years, but the last part, <laughs> once I figured this out, I just coasted through. Because I never took another note in class, which is why I give a lecture here that you don't have to take notes, okay? You should be paying attention to try to figure out what is it they're trying to say. They're trying to hide the information from you, okay? And you've got to figure out what the outline is. They're giving you all this extraneous information. Like, what did my stories in the beginning have to do with anything about what my theme is today? Well, you don't even know what the theme is today. But what I often do in this class is 
The next class, I put up the theme. So the theme from the last class is, in, well, actually, I came up, a guy, I was talking about this yesterday, a guy was visiting me, and he said engineering is har harnessing the forces of nature for the benefit of mankind. Uh, one of you had a definition that class that had something about benefit of mankind in there or something, okay? Um, engineering involves, and I told you this, this is my because, remember being an engineer, complexity, ambiguity, uncertainty, and safety. Um, and then this morning I decided to write down, well, you know, because I got some other things on what an engineer is. I don't want to beat it to death, but I will probably beat it to death. Um, the Hippocratic Oath can be summarized as do no harm. You've probably heard that before, right? The engineering code is to try to do good. It's a little bit better than just doing no harm. Okay, we want to actually improve life for people. Okay, so that's one of the things that, that's sort of what I'd like you to take away from last uh, Thursday's lecture. The other thing is, I told you, I'd, Jerry will post this, this book in pieces. The next chapter is on canals, okay? Uh, and this is, this is some Roman aqueduct or canal, or no, this is, some, well, it is Roman. This is, this is in France. Well, you can't really see it very well, but it's a beautiful scene. Uh, hopefully it shows up better on the web. The Grand Canal in China. China had rivers going east and west, and they decided they should build a canal. It was really sort of for military purposes, just like the roads, the Roman roads and the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System. Um, this is someone on a Roman uh, canal. I don't know if it's, no, it isn't Roman. This is iron. This is a British canal. Uh, but they're in their boat, high above the, the valley, running down their canal. But the Erie Canal, we talked about the Erie Canal. You can read about these things. This is the building of the Erie Canal, and it talks about um, Benjamin Wright was the first civil engineer in the country, and every civil engineer of the next 50 years, he was the engineer for the Erie Canal. He knew nothing about engineering when he was given the job of building the Erie Canal, but he kind of learned very quickly. The Panama Canal, which is considered one of the greatest achievements of the last hundred, well, it's more than a hundred years, uh, building the Panama Canal. This is sort of an interesting, well, I don't know if you can see this one very well. This doesn't show up. I think I have learned how to brighten this up. Let's see. This is a Greek canal, and the cliffs are on either, they just cut straight through the rock, okay? Um, Anyway, so there's various things on canals. This is, and then there's also, I'll probably throw in aqueducts here. These are Roman aqueducts, okay. Um, What's the difference? Between a canal and aqueduct? Aqueduct is just to transport water for drinking and bathing and things like that. A canal is basically a water roadway, okay, to transport goods, if you will, okay. Can, aqueducts are often smaller in scope, okay. And then I guess we'll do bridges next time. But anyway, I'm not going to spend time on this. There was actually, not my fault, a student complained in one of the evaluations last year that I didn't give enough reading. <laughs> so here's more reading. I gave you, you know, the whole, the whole book. That'll keep you. So can't complain I didn't give you reading this time. <laughs> but you're not going to be quizzed on it, so it's up to you whether you're going to read it. Okay. The other thing is I've been trying to figure out what other people say about engineering, and they say all kinds of things. This is a book called Exploring Engineering. It's in its third edition. I'm usually impressed when I see something in a third edition because it sort of suggests that, um, uh, let's see, if, okay. It sort of suggests that people read part of the first and second editions, okay? Why would it be in a third edition, right? So anyway, this is some definitions in the beginning of that. That book, this book is sort of a, if you're a sophomore at Purdue or somewhere, they might teach it out of this book to tell you what all the different types of engineering are. But nonetheless, it's got some interesting quotes about engineering. Um, it is engineering that changes the world. Maybe I ought to blow this up some more. Um, engineering is the art of doing what, the, that was Isaac Asimov, by the way, if you know who he is. Engineering is the art of doing that well with one dollar that can, any bungler can do with two, okay? Uh, so that's something about economics and engineering. Uh, 
Engineering is not merely analysis. Engineering is not merely the possession of the capacity to get elegant solutions to non-existent engineering problems. Engineering is practicing the art of organizing forces of techno technological change. Engineers operate at the interface between science and society. Gordon Stanley Brown. Who is Gordon Stanley Brown? Who was he? He was Dean of Engineering at MIT 50 years ago. He was the one who took engineering from being just kind of traditional draft, teaching drafting and things, and he turned it into engineering science. It was the same time we moved, Alfred Sloan gave money and they created the Sloan School of Management out of the, the Department of Business and Industrial Development in the School of Engineering. So the 1950s is when MIT uh, took management out of engineering and put science in. And Gordon Brown was one of those people who put it in, okay? And Professor Flemings, if you ask, ask him, he, he was sort of a real engineer. And all of a sudden, when he was a young assistant or associate professor, Gordon Brown came along and said, we're going to do engineering science. And I've heard him tell me the story about he started scrambling to make sure he could get his ten tenure by proving that he was a scientist mm -hmm. as opposed to an engineer. Today, I mean, I, uh, when I became acting department head in 1989, hey, I, I had replaced Flemings for six months, and I used to get in at 6 a.m. And so one time, I decided to go over to the file cabinet and read my tenure letters. <laughs> I've told people the story. You're not supposed to be able to do that. I said, Well, why not? No one else was around. I read my tenure letters, uh, and so I know what people said about me. Uh, obviously, they said some decent things, or I wouldn't have gotten tenure. But one person described me as a pure engineer. Now, he meant it as a compliment, but I'll tell you that 90% of the faculty around here would consider that a slur, even today. We just had a dean of engineering who went off to be head of the National Science Foundation, now president of a university, and he would not let any engineers through the tenure process. He was enough of a wannabe scientist. He thought anyone doing real problem solving was, was not, not pure. In fact, I'm going to tell you the story of some of the history of engineering. And you're going to find that's part of the difference between the culture of Caltech and the culture of MIT. Yes? Is there some like, economic force that drove us to engineering science? Um, it was partly World War II. Um, and we'll get some quotes later here. But the, uh, the scientists came up with the creative ideas for World War II. But who carried it out? Engineers. Engineers. And you're going to see some quotes here in a little bit about people saying that, okay? Remember, a scientist discovers that which exists, an engineer creates that which never was. So the scientist, and it, well, I might as well talk about the hierarchy of snobbery here, okay? <laughs> the scientist look down on the engineers. In medicine, the engineers look down on the clinicians, the practicing doctors, because they're just, they're just empiricism, you know? If everybody has a cold, you come in with the sniffles, you got a cold. And they diagnose you with the same as everything else, OK? And if you read the book I gave you yesterday, you'll find he divides thinking into system one and system two. And system one is your intuitive thinking. And he will explain that, hey, if everyone has a cold, you come in with the sniffles, you've got a cold too. They don't necessarily start system two, which is the analytical thinking, OK? And that's what Gordon Brown is here. Engineering is not merely analysis. It's got a lot of uh, intuitive stuff in it. And that book, one of the reasons I gave it to you, there's a chapter, and when we get to the book, I'll spend some time on it. But, but uh, what's, how do we, what is an expert, OK? And actually, there's some quotes that uh, I'll probably give you tomorrow that, on some of that but about what constitutes an expert. Because you're trying to become experts in engineering, right, in theory. Scientists investigate that which already is. I, engineers, that which never has been. They attribute this to Albert Einstein. That's wrong. I just only put it in. You've heard the quote from Theodore von Karman, is von Karman. Scientists dream about doing great things. Engineers do them. OK? James Michener? OK? Engineers are the interface between science and society, right? I mean, I, I'm giving you some of these things because I want you to start thinking about what you think engineering is. I don't think most of you in your engineering classes get a real feel, feel for what engineering is. You get a good feel for engineering science. Your problem sets are engineering science. You're given 
just all the right pieces of the puzzle, no more, no less, and you plug and chug, and you learn how to grind through, that's not engineering. That might be learning to be a scientist and solve differential equations, but it's not engineering, okay? Engineering is um, solving problems that, uh, for which there is no known solution, okay, is another way of saying it. You can say lots of things about what engineering is. This is a quote from Thomas Edison in 1911. There is no question but that the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is the best technical school in the country. I've found the graduates of tech to have a better, more practical, more usable knowledge as a class. That's just, I'm not talking about any one of you as being good, okay? <laughs> than the graduates of any other school in the country. The salvation of America lies in the MIT. You know, MIT. Hey, that was in my 1911. Yeah. 19, well, yeah, well, I got some other quotes from 1911 um, or 1912. Um, MIT really was a, uh, a watershed school in terms of defining engineering, and I'll, we'll get to that. This is another Thomas Edison quote from a year later. It's a little bit redundant, maybe. The future of America demands technical education of its young system. There's no question, but MIT is the best technical school. If every state had such a school, it would be great for the country. It would improve businesses, business conditions. It would teach us how to grapple with the evils of the day in a competent, sane manner. Now, at this point, what company did Thomas Edison head? General Electric, exactly. And so he wanted to hire engineers, okay? And he found that the MIT engineers were among the best. General Electric was actually the merging of Thomas Edison's company with a guy named Elihu Thompson. Anybody ever heard of Elihu Thompson? Okay, well, uh, I wouldn't expect that you had. But Elihu Thompson started an electrical engineering company up here in Lynn, Massachusetts, okay? It was called the Thompson Houston Company. You can look in Wikipedia for all this if you like. In fact, I just happen to have the Wikipedia article here. Gee, surprise, surprise. Um, and there's Elihu Thompson from Manchester, England, died in Swampscott, Massachusetts. Um, in 1880, he left Central to pursue research in the emerging field of electrical engineering. That's the beginning of electrical engineering was the 1880s. We'll talk about why that was. Between 1880 and 85, he averaged 21 patent applications uh, annually, doubling that in the next five years. At the time that he merged his company with Edison to form the General Electric we know now, know now today, he had 380 patents. He was number two behind Edison, who had 420, okay, when they merged their companies in 1880 or 1892. He served as acting president. I just learned this. I always thought he'd been a faculty member. He served as acting president of MIT from 20 to 23, overcoming his distaste. He was actually, he had the Thompson Lab up here in Lynn, Massachusetts, which is now a General Electric where they build jet engines. Um, his distaste for management accepted the role during a critical period of the university when he, they could not otherwise find a president. Hey, if you were looking for work in 1920, you could come to MIT and you could apply to be president. <laughs> Um, and Thompson hated management, but in fact, I'm going to argue that management is part of engineering. Okay? Anybody have any questions? Okay. Is yeah. The Caltech MIT story for another class. Oh, no, it's coming up. Yay. It's coming up. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, what's the difference between science and engineering? Well, we've kind of talked around that. How old? How old is engineering as a profession? It goes back thousands of years. If you're talking kind of mechanical engineering. Electrical engineering didn't exist until 1880. Why did it not exist until 1880? Because we didn't have a good source of electricity. It was Edison and Westinghouse that once they developed electrical generators and distribution and stuff, all of a sudden all kinds of people, including Elihu Thompson, started inventing things. We talk about the internet today and the, all the apps and the things that developers do. Well, in 1880, it was the new thing was not the internet, it was electricity. And people were out developing new things to solve new problems. But we didn't have material science and engineering as it's like considered today until the 70s, right? Uh, 1870s. Well, material science, yes, yeah, no, as no, we no. see it today. I'm going to talk about the history of MIT and when the courses. Course one at MIT is civil engineering. 
That's because before that, at RPI, there was only one course. It was civil to distinguish it from military. But I'm getting ahead of myself in the history. Okay, but having other questions, I mean, it's okay to get ahead of me. Okay. Um, what types of engineering subdisciplines? What's PE license? These are, I'm going to keep going back to that little questionnaire I gave you. So, what is engineering? If you look it up on the web, this had a couple of good quotes. Um, engineering is the application of science to solve and math to solve problems. Okay, engineering is problem solving, but in fact, we use math and science to solve those problems in most cases. We're not just solving you know, child welfare abuse or something like that, although if you've got some good math and science way to do that, that would be good, but uh, it actually would be good to solve it anyway, but um, anyway. Um, scientists and inventors often get the credit for innovations that advance the human condition, but it is engineers who are instrumental in making those innovations available to the world. Kind of what happened after World War II, why did Gordon Brown go to engineering science? They wanted to get closer back to uh, the the uh, um, the roots of how we solved significant problems that we didn't know how to solve, whether it was radar, uh, fission for the Manhattan Project, or or bomb sites. I mean, that's the Draper Lab. Okay, they made bomb sites. Um, and phys physicist Freeman Dyson wrote. A good scientist is a person with original ideas. A good engineer is a person who makes a design that works with as few original ideas as possible. There are, there are no prima donnas in engineering. There are plenty of prima donnas in science, OK? Um, and actually, there are, we have our prima donnas. But, but uh, in general, engineers sort of take a back seat to a lot of other things. Uh, what are the types of engineering? Well, if you go to Wikipedia again, you know, that, that source of all knowledge, um, they list these fields of engineering. Uh, civil engineering was the first after military. Chemical engineering didn't come, uh, come along until the 1890s. Electrical, not until the 1880s. Mechanical goes back thousands of years. Anyway, so everyone's got their list. And you can go to Wikipedia if the materials engineers want to find out where you, ex where you fit in. These are the primary areas, and chemical engineering is the first one that they list, because I think they did it alphabetically. And materials engineering is a subgroup of chemical engineering. Okay? And nuclear engineering is in there somewhere, okay, so far as that goes. But uh, there's lots of ways to divide up engineering. It turns out. Um, the National Academy of Sciences was chartered by Abraham Lincoln in, the, uh, uh, in 1863. Um, I hadn't really planned on this, but here's, this is the making of the National Academy of Engineering 25 years later. It was founded in like 1864, so this is, what's this, uh, 18, 1989. Let's go back down. Here's Abraham Lincoln sitting with the founders of the National Academy of Sciences portrayed with Abraham Lincoln at the signing of the Academy Charter, Charter Benjamin Pierce, um, Anthony Bakke, Joseph Henry, Louis Agassi, who was a professor at Harvard, um, Senator Henry Wilson, Admiral Charles Davis, so the military was involved, Benjamin A. Gould, anyway. So the National Academy of Sciences, which is a quasi it's not a governmental agency, but it gets a lot of its funding for doing work uh, studies from the, the National Research Council as a subsidiary. They formed the National Academy of Engineering in 1964. And this is, if you're, there's only about 2,200 members of the National Academy of Engineering out of about 2.2 million engineers in the country. So only about one out of 1,000 engineers gets elected to the National Academy. And you can only be elected by your peers, which means people who are already members. You can't be nominated by someone who's not a member. And it used to be really be a very much of an old boys club. It was 98% male. Uh, they're trying to, and they, I think they're up to about 5% female now. But anyway, uh, uh, but they had aerospace engineering, bioengineering, chemical engineering. This is alphabetical, but these are the sections. And here's materials engineering section 9, mechanical is section 10. 
you're going to see a little bit later, mechanical engineering has actually got the most engineers in the country, okay, as a field. And then they've added these others, earth resources, special fields, okay. So there's lots of ways to divide up engineering. Um, there is, and I used to give this out on the first day of class, but I would encourage you to read this article by Norm Augustine on socioengineering. This was a 1993, yeah, 1993 commencement address at Colorado State. He grew up in Colorado, or at least his mother lived there. Um, and I assume he knew his mother at some point. Uh, but anyway, Norm Augustine, anybody know who he is, was? Okay, he first became a little bit famous. He worked for Martin Marietta and became a little bit famous because he wrote a book called Augustine's Laws. Um, and there's a hard copy version of it, which is nowhere near as good as the early versions. But it's a lot of tongue-in-cheek, tongue but facts that I mean, maybe I'll bring in some of that stuff. But then he went on to become CEO of Martin Marietta, Lockheed Martin. Um, and he was asked to be scientific, um, the president of science advisor. He's been chair of the National Academy of Engineering. He's a spokesman for engineering, a national spokesman for engineering. He's a graduate of Princeton, but he sits on the MIT Corporation, okay? Um, and he's a very interesting, thoughtful person, and he has interesting ways to look at things. Well, he, he's talked about uh, uh, forms of engineering and ages of engineering, um, and 1957 was when he started mechanical age of engineering from the mid, seven, he says from the mid 1700s, I know it's too small for you to read. You can read this later. The electrical engineering age from 1879, the information um, age of engineering from 1906, the socio-engineering age from 1979. What is socio-engineering? Socio-engineering is all these externalities like economics, environment, finance, um, you know, not in my backyard. You know, you want to build, you want to build a prison. Everybody wants more prisons, put those criminals in jail, but no one wants it in their backyard. Okay, so what do you do? Where do you put it? Where do we put the last president I know in Massachusetts? Is down here in Dedham, and it's between. They have one, one part of 128 that goes south, and the other part goes north, and in between is just the wasteland. It's a pretty big wasteland. So they put a prison there, because the neighbors are just the cars going by. <laughs> okay, uh, that's one solution, um, as far as that goes. Anyway, this is something that you, you will get on, on Stellar. It's the American Society of Engineering Education, Engineering by the Numbers. And here you can see mechanical engineering among all engineering. This is bachelor's degree by discipline. Uh, there's a total of 83,000 engineers graduated in whatever year they're looking at. Uh, mechanical engineers were 19,000 over 20%. So sometimes you'll see definitions of engineering that talks about mechanical, because over 20% of all engineers are mechanical. Um, obviously, af after that is civil. That surprised me. A lot of the schools out west, Purdue and Minnesota and Illinois, have huge civil engineering departments. I guess they all flunk out or something. Um, but they have huge civil engineering departments. MIT does not rank number one in civil. Okay. In fact, when I was department head, I used to say, well, one of the differences between the School of Science and the School of Engineering at MIT is if you ask, in, in the School of Engineering, you should ask which departments of the eight departments are not that ranked number one in the nation in their field. And civil, it's bioengineering, it's ranked four or five, and that's because it's sort of new to MIT. Um, and... Um, I think that's, that's the only one. You can think of any other department. Anyway, I think there's two that are not ranked number one. Over in the School of, Engin School of Science, it's easier to ask which ones are ranked number one in their field. Okay? And out of eight or nine departments, I think molecular biology is number one. Uh, I'm not sure. I think psych brain and cognitive science is maybe number one. Anyway. But it's not physics and it's not chemistry. Those prima donnas in physics and chemistry rule the roost in a lot of things at MIT until recently. 
uh, Professor Reif actually it used to be when a president of MIT, if he was an engineer, he would have a scientist for a provost. He would try to balance. Professor Reif doesn't care. All the all the leaders up there, they're all electrical engineers. They they, I mean, they all come from his department. <laughs> okay, uh, but they're actually doing a reasonably good job, better than any administration since Paul Gray in the 1980s. The other administrations were not so hot um, for various reasons. But since this is a materials and mechanical course, I highlighted these two. There are about, uh, what is this, 1, 1,100 me uh, metal metallurgical and materials engineers. If you look at this whole thing, and you'll have it on the Stellar website, it's about a 40-page article of statistics. But you'll see that um, the number of master's degrees in um, mechanical engineering is very relatively small. In materials, it's like eight, almost 900. Materials is really a graduate program as opposed to an undergraduate program. Is this master's or bachelor's? This is bachelor's. There is, they have the data in there for master's. Okay, this is bachelor's. You know what you're about? This is? Um, it didn't really say, but I think this is fairly recent, okay, within the last 10 years, okay? I have some other data going back to 97, which I'll show you. But anyway, this is, it's not, too, it hasn't changed dramatically in the last 10 years, but I don't know the exact year. Well, I'd like to say, you know, we graduated like at least 200 petroleum engineers a year, and that would be 20% of the petroleum engineers. Well, but does petroleum on here? Yeah, petroleum is right after materials. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, but, yeah, okay, but Texas A&M, you probably are 25% of all the petroleum engineers. It's the number one program in petroleum in the country, probably the world, right? And then one of the reasons is you dominate, okay? And you also have a lot of very highly qualified faculty who come from Texas. A lot of people in Texas go to Texas A&M, okay? But yes, question here? You have a question? Same question about same computer Because now with like, you know, apps getting so popular, you can start computer science. Oh, compu well, computer science, you, well, I cut it off. They, they don't consider computer science engineering, okay? They say outside engineering here, I mean, 3,000, so they'd be way over here and stuff. But there's always problems with how you collect all this type of data and, and stuff, okay? because well, this is specifically like bachelor's degrees. So it doesn't count all the people like my cousin who go into the industry without getting their bachelor's degrees. And it doesn't count all the people where it's like, oh, you're in materials engineering or chemical engineering with a petroleum focus. Or, right. You know, like. Yep. So there's. So that could be throwing numbers yeah. off. It's statistics, right? And it depends on what your base is, right? Actually, that book, Thinking Fast and Slow, he's got a whole chapter on what he calls uh, where they, they, people ignore the denominator, okay? Um, and so, and, and they get lots of intuitive uh, feelings about things. Uh, I did highlight some other things on here. I just took the first five pages. Among uh, <laughs> bachelor's degrees awarded, MIT with 666 is 25th, Georgia Tech gives more bachelor's degree. I'm sure this data is fairly accurate, okay, in terms of you can actually define a degree. Uh, there's a lot of data on uh, minorities and women. Um, this is bachelor's degrees awarded to women by school. MIT's 289 out of uh, 666. 289 over 666 doesn't sound like 43% to me, but anyway. Yeah, well, it's almost 300. Yeah, but okay, maybe it is 43%. But you want to know why? Because we admit now 45% women or whatever, okay? Yeah. Uh, when I was, when I came here in 68, my class was less than 10% women. There was McCormick Hall, mm -hmm. and that's where all the women lived, okay? So <laughs> MIT Asian Americans, 165. Uh, down here, African Americans, 46. Uh, this is uh, Hispanics, 76, okay. MIT actually has worked very hard, and because we give better scholarships uh, to enhance them to come, but we didn't always do what was right. My second year on the faculty, uh, I was an advisor to course 3C, which doesn't exist anymore, but it's sort of an interdisciplinary course in course three. And so I had this student who was, he was a naval ROTC, he was black, he, he was just an outstanding leader. I mean, if he walked in the room, you know, you could feel his presence, right? And he was flunking out of MIT. Why? If he had gone to any other school in the country, 
with his full ride four year NROTC scholarship, he would have been top of his class, but he wasn't at MIT. Why? Well, uh, so I'll tell you a story about something similar that happened over at BU uh, in the management school. So some donor to BU management school decided they wanted, he wanted to have more minorities, and so he gave 10 full ride scholarships to go to management school. Okay, ordinarily you pay your own way through management school, right? He gave uh, 10 of these and they gave out 10 fellowships the first year uh, to minority students and none of them made it through. And they, rather than saying, oh, well, you know, minorities just can't hack it, they said, wait, this is our fault. We thought we would bring them in here and just throw them in with everybody else and so they, the next year they admitted 10 more, but they told them, you're getting a free ride. You're gonna be here every Thursday and Tuesday afternoon, evenings, and we're gonna have a tutor here for you to help you learn how to study. And eight out of 10 made it that year. What I saw in 1977 with this outstanding NROTC student who eventually flunked out of MIT, uh, he couldn't hack it. And I was writing to the administration and said, look, you can't admit these people and not and just leave them to flounder they didn't grow up in a household where their parents read stories to them they didn't grow up in a household where their parents went to college they didn't have the environment it's not they're not smart enough it's just they don't have the same experience base and so now we actually you look on the infinite corridor here and we actually have a whole a whole section of it which is uh, minority you know for dedicated to minorities which is why we now have uh, a reasonable fraction of Hispanics and minorities who are graduating, but hey, 40 years ago it wasn't that way. They just figured if you admit them, that you let them be. And that's not the way to success, okay? It's not the way to success for, for anybody. Um, I told you that a lot of the problems we face when you get out there are not technical problems, they're management problems, people problems. Um, when I became department head in 95, this department had a terrible reputation about women, okay? My predecessor happened to be a male chauvinist par excellence, okay? In my first two months, I was asked, how much were we going to contribute to the $850,000 settlement for the woman who didn't get tenure under him, okay? And I said, well, you know what my budget is. He left me with a $2 million deficit. Uh, where, do you, where do you want to take it? And that's what I told the assistant dean, and she kind of grudgingly hung up, and I, they didn't take anything from me then. They just took it later. But uh, so I, I was faced with this problem. I was told senior women scientists at Bell Labs were telling women postdocs at Bell Labs, don't even interview the materials department at MIT. Just a bunch of male chauvinists. And you know what? There was a little truth to that. He wasn't the only male chauvinist. And we had had other women who probably should have gotten tenure who didn't in the previous 30 years, but without going into all that. So I had to figure out how to solve the problem, right? What's engineering? It's problem solving, okay? Well, the first thing I did is there were two women who were lecturers in the department. One was a senior, one was a junior lecturer. They were archeologists. They're still here. And they had been kept out of, they wanted a home in the department, but my predecessor had kept them out. And within the first two months, I had discussions with them. I had discussions with the provost. Actually, I had letters with the provost. And I agreed to take them on and be a department head to them, not to put them on the rank list, which means they weren't going to be part of the department. Because I asked them, I said, could you teach, th could you TA 3091? And they both said, no. OK, well, that's the fr introductory fr freshman course. And I had a criteria. If you couldn't TA 3091, you weren't really fit to be a faculty member in this department, okay? I mean, I, I thought that was a fairly objective. And they said no, so anyway, I, I basically said, okay, I'll take you on. And, well, over the next five years, it was major war in the department. It's not major war anymore, but there's still an underlying skirmishes every now and then where people are taking shots, okay? But nonetheless, um, that was one thing I did because I needed an existence proof that there could be women in the department. Uh, at the time, there, was, there were no senior women. There was one junior woman. If 
fact, my predecessor had stepped down six months earlier than I thought he was going to because he didn't want to take the one woman who was coming up for tenure, take her case forward because she was going to lose. Because she had not been mentored, okay? Not that she wasn't smart enough. She's gone off to Tufts and she wins teaching awards for the whole university over there. She was actually a very good scientist in many ways, but she never was kind of taught how to do it in the impactful way. But anyway, but the other thing I did is I started looking at the statistics like this. And so far as high minorities, not just women, but minorities, how many PhD material scientists do you think we graduate in this country a year? One. Okay? And I just, and that you're going to get your faculty from typically PhD material scientists. And I said, well, that's a loser because General Electric and Intel and AT&T, they're going to be throwing money, millions of dollars at these people to come work for them because they got to meet the HEW quotas too, okay? And so I, I remembered a story I'd heard when I was over at Sloan. I took the Sloan Senior Executive Program. And they told the story of this guy who graduated from Sloan and he went off and he became the cocoa futures king. And he made a lot of money in cocoa because he could predict the price of cocoa with better accuracy than anybody else in the world. And afterwards, he went off to become a university president and other things um, to join a faculty. And then he began, eventually became a university president. And someone asked him, well, how are, why were you so successful? And he said, it's simple. In the spring of the year, which is mostly in uh, the Ivory Coast, which is where most of the cocoa comes from, but spring of the year, whether it's north, north, northern, northern hemisphere or southern, he would send people out to count the buds on the trees. Hey! So I decided I needed to figure out how to count the buds on the trees. So the first thing I did is I knew there was a statistic that this department produced one out of every seven PhDs in the department. And as I used to say, quietly, and half the good ones. <laughs> okay? So if I wanted to find good women or minorities, they were probably already here in graduate school and you can usually tell by the first or second year who the better students are. And so I started courting these people in their second year of graduate school. Uh, after five years, I had hired eight faculty. Four women, four men. One of the women was Hispanic, one of the men was uh, black American, African American, and another woman of the women was gay. I had all the bases covered. When I stepped down, I ne I'd never even thought about it. Tom Devine, who had been one of my grad, had been with me in graduate school here, and had just become department head at Berkeley in materials, he calls me up about a week after I stepped down. He says, "Tom, I hear you were re really successful at hiring women and minorities." And I said, "Well, oh, I guess, you know, 50% women, 50% men, one one black and one one Hispanic." And I didn't even know the other woman was gay. At time. Actually, I guess I did. But anyway, <laughs> I, I didn't. I wasn't even counting. Today, I count. Okay, because. It's in the news. Um, and I said, well, yeah. He said, well, how'd you do it? I said, I just hired the most qualified people. Okay. But I did. I always had a Martin Luther King scholar, which is basically if you could find a minority, um, you could get a, and they wanted to go on sabbatical. When I go to conferences and I'd see a minority faculty member at some place, I'd say, hey, when are you going to take a sabbatical? Would you like to come to MIT? We can provide you a full salary. And they get half salary from their own university, so it wasn't a bad deal. And now, unfortunately, I was never able to hire one of them, mostly because of the backlash from the faculty in the department. Okay. Um, one woman is now a member of the National Academy. Uh, she was she had graduated from MIT. She was ready to come back to MIT. She had just gotten her tenure anyway. Um, but. There is still a lot of resistance. It's hidden resistance. I guess I'll take a moment. If any of you have to leave, go ahead and leave. Uh, one of the things I did when I sat down with the two women faculty, the archaeologists, I said, okay, tell me what the, the problems are, okay, um, from your, your perspective. And the senior woman said, well, if you go to a faculty meeting, you're going to find that the male faculty will, if, if one of the women faculties if a woman is talking, the males will interrupt her. In mid, mid, and they won't do that to the other men. So I went to the next faculty meeting and I paid attention to this. And it was absolutely true. Okay? So what did I do? 
if someone, if a male tried to interrupt a woman when she's talking, I'd say, excuse me, and so and so is talking. Let her finish. And slowly the faculty learned, not by my telling them they were being chauvinist, because they didn't even know they were being chauvinist. Okay, let's face it, okay? Uh, but this is one way where a little bit of leadership can go a long way if you understand what the problem is. I didn't, I didn't understand the problem. I never paid, I had probably been guilty of it, but I never thought about it. Actually, I interrupt everybody, <laughs> okay? The other thing that I heard, I was talking to one guy who was an alumnus who actually had worked for my predecessor as a graduate student, and I was talking to him about this problem, and he said, I'm the father of four daughter, daughters, and one thing I've learned is people who don't respect women don't respect men either, and I found that's absolutely true. Okay, so when you look at these things, and let's say you're a woman, you're being disrespected, don't take it personally. They disrespect respect other people too. They just don't have respect for people. Okay, and then the people who do respect women also will respect other men. I mean, it just it sort of makes sense. Okay, if you think about it, but you actually have to spend the time thinking about it. And that gets back to Kahneman's book about their system one, which is your intuitive thinking. And there's system two, which is your analytical. You've got to be a little analytical about some of these things and figure out what the root cause is. And that's some of, we'll talk about that some more next time. Okay, thanks.